welcome to Truth Sentinel, watching over the truth in the news. Today's date is the 11th of May 2014. Welcome to all listeners. Uh, Truth Sentinel is now back in London after a number of weeks in Ukraine, a country which is rapidly deteriorating. As I was leaving um, Odessa actually um, in the taxi, there was crowds marching down the street uh, chanting Apparently they actually went on to uh, the police station and demanded some prisoners be released. Since I've heard things have quietened down in Odessa a bit, but um, I don't think it's over yet. Civil war seems inevitable. Today's news. Still on the subject of Ukraine, pro-Russian pro -Russian separatists in eastern Ukraine holding self-rule referendums. And uh, apparently, according to the BBC, there are um, chaotic scenes at polling stations, with it being very badly organised. But of course, if you read Russia today, then it will give you a far more positive view of events. And um, you know, who's telling us the truth? Probably, it's probably somewhere in the middle. I would say, I would expect the result to be for East Ukraine to go towards Russia, and it will be interesting to see the reaction from Putin, who's distanced himself from this poll. More again on Ukraine later. Uh, ceasefire has been violated in uh, Sudan only hours after it was um, supposed to come into effect. Hundreds of people across Vietnam have protested against China's um, role in a dispute over there on the sea. Uh, the la apparently that's the largest rallies of their kind recently in that communist country. Other news this week. The Daily Mail in the UK uh, printed yet another nauseating story about the Queen and how hard she works and showing a photo with a caption um, underneath about her heavy tiara that she had to wear, um, which isn't you know that heavy at all actually. And if it is, well, how about just take it off then? You know, it's not so difficult. She was attending some ceremony that happens every eight years or so to um, award some or create some new knights. I don't know, it's all rather ridiculous. Um, the, the, the article was comment on her arduous long haul flights abroad. Now, no offense, but if it's, if she was in economy class, fine. Um, you know, a long flight abroad w could be uh, quite arduous, but somehow I don't think her flights are going to be arduous. She's going to have five star treatment. She'll have the best food. She'll have, uh, probably a seat big enough for a queen to sit on. Probably even a throne on there. I wouldn't be surprised. So, you know, less of the less of the arduous work she has to do, please. I mean, it's an outdated concept as far as I'm concerned and only continues to, to be um, popular in the UK due to the continuous brainwashing of the masses that the Queen is good value for money and the royal family because of the amount of tourists they bring in. Tourists never get to meet the Queen, incidentally. Um, and so this tourist service could be maintained at one thousandth of the, of the cost just by, um, you know, having someone dress up as the Queen or something. You know, I am being a bit flippant, but enough said on that anyway. Um, other news this week, Nigerian girls that were kidnapped. Um, a lot of people um, jumping on the bandwagon now. John Kerry offers US support. President Obama and his wife Michelle are heartbroken. You know, I really, I really wish someone would comfort them because I, I hate to think of Obama and Michelle heartbroken. I mean, they must be crying themselves to sleep. Um, I really don't like it when they use those words like that cheaply because I, I doubt very much if they're heartbroken. Maybe the um, the families of a daughter who's been taken might be heartbroken. Um, I actually find it hard to believe that Obama has uh, any way um, of being heartbroken or showing empathy because um, I say that after watching his speech after returning from Malaysia. Uh, where he joked about uh, flight MH370, referred to it a number of times, and um, that that was after coming back from Malaysia, so it's pretty insensitive. Um, you know, if he really cared about missing people, there was 239 uh, missing passengers on that plane. So why is that such a big joke? Something you can joke about at an after dinner speech. Then he joked about NSA surveillance, like that's all a big joke, you know. Actually, I'm, I'm, um, I and many other millions of people are actually really upset that that he thinks it's fine for the NSA to spy on the entire world. You know, what's it got? What, what's his business? What I'm writing or uh, what I'm saying on the phone 
or what I'm typing into my computer. It's none of his business, you know. I don't like him making jokes about it. Also joking about his health care reform, which I know isn't popular with a lot of people. And then, uh, to top that, uh, for his finale, um, joking about President Putin, you know. Somehow, I don't think in the years of um, Kennedy and Khrushchev, they would have been jo uh, cracking... Uh, juvenile jokes about each other because they knew the seriousness of the situation they're in. We're on the brink of World War Three, and he's making jokes about Putin's chest. I mean, it's just, I, I actually think we're in danger with him in charge. I think we're in danger. But I, I'm not just being um, talking about America. I'm talking about the UK as well. Cameron has also been um, saying some stupid things this week also about the missing girls and... Uh, Anyway, I mean, I thought Obama's speech was undiplomatic, unprofessional, uh, unprofessional and insensitive. Um, but anyway, that's my opinion. What do you think about that? Let me know. And I mean, I saw a, uh, Michelle's video as well. She was reading from a teleprompter. Now, if you want to sound sincere or if you want to look sincere, it's best just to just talk from the heart, you know. Um, if you start just looking at words on a teleprompter, and it did, did seem like she was putting a fake um, I'm concerned face on. Uh, the, you know, politicians and their um, their friends and partners tend to do. I mean, more than, way more than half a million people go missing every year in the UK and the USA. You know, they're, they're actually in a position where they can do something about that. So they're just using it for some political gain or for some reason, you know. I mean, I've heard they're going to be moving security services in to try and help which probably means they're planning some kind of operation over there I mean Cameron uh, said that um, he rang the Nigerian president to offer anything that would be helpful and agreed to send out a team of counter-terrorism and intelligence experts to work alongside the bigger American team that's going out there I suggest they're out there for some other reason or for, for definitely for some ulterior motive because the moment you th um, it seems like um, the president and uh, other politicians care, it's the moment to be concerned. What are they actually up to? Um, Putin visited Crimea this week and gave um, yet another display of Russian military power. Um, killer robots are to be debated at the UN. Um, I think they're going to be discussing uh, the ethics of whether automated killing should be allowed. It should be a very short meeting. The answer should probably be no, uh, but I'm sure they'll draw up guidelines on situations where um, it's ethically right to kill someone with a robot. And it'll probably start with um, exceptional circumstances a robot can be used to kill with someone, and then eventually, as laws are relaxed, which they always are, um, they'll just be picking people off on the streets. Other news of a more of an astronomical nature. Uh, sibling son. Uh, has been found 110 light years from Earth, that, that report from RT, Russia Today. The sun could have a sibling, according to researchers at the University of Texas. They believe this star was born from the same cloud of gas as our sun, and this could give uh, astronomers fresh uh, ideas on how life on Earth started. I'm, I'm fairly skeptical personally on that we know actually much about how life started or, you know, much about the universe. I, I do think in this day and age we think we're a lot more intelligent than we really are, but that's just my personal opinion. Not everyone agrees with that, I know. We'll be looking to the skies for other parts of today's program. Um, I also uh, noticed on Twitter, my Twitter page, that a Colorado witness in Centennial reported seeing a silent missile shaped objects with lights that moved toward ground level about um, late evening um, a number of days ago on um, May the 8th I think it was um, this year and this came from the Mutual UFO Network uh, otherwise known as MUFON and we're going to be talking more on the subject of UFOs imminently just to mention last week's um, last week's episode. Remember this is a weekly show, I do try to get this out uh, within uh, seven days of the last one. Um, it has sort of slipped a bit um, to different days, I know it used to be Wednesday, then Thursday, Friday, Saturday. It just depends on other work commitments as well, but I think I'm going to aim for the weekend. I think the weekend's a good time um, to do this because there's usually some, I usually have some free time. 
we're getting more and more people on the Truth Sentinel team. Uh, we're getting researchers, um, sound people who've offered to help, and um, thanks for uh, people that are contacting us to offer to help. Anyone else you can, please let me know. Any guests that would like to come on, please uh, contact us. Um, last episode, we talked about Ukraine. We had reviews on documentaries about um, PSYOPs, uh, Glenn Greenwald, uh, Edward Snowden. Then we had um, we had our guest Mark Cocking talking about the global banking elite, and there'll be more from him today. Um, he'll be talking a bit more about that and also commenting on the weather. Remember to leave any comments in the comments section underneath the video on the Scott Sentinel um, YouTube channel. I've actually had to move channels as I mentioned due to um, a block from uh, Caravan uh, to Midnight. Um, it's a misunderstanding but you know it is it has affected this channel. I've you know we've lost a number of listeners um, due to all the subscribers um, basically not seeing uploads so please resubscribe to Scott Sentinel channel which you should find information about on the uh, previous Carafans of Midnight channel and if you want to say hello or come and say hello on the show please contact us uh, there's various ways to do that Twitter Facebook and uh, just contacting us via the, the email section on um, YouTube today we're going to talk about UFOs for the first time we're just touching on this subject today it won't be in depth but it will be an introduction and uh, we'll be focusing a little on the silver orb or silver sphere phenomenon. Um, there's different shapes of UFOs as well as the um, saucer shaped UFOs and many people have seen um, also seen the silver orb style of UFOs and there's a documentary actually if you want to find out more about it called um, The Enigma of Flying Spheres that's just one documentary which you can find on a very good um, website called topdocumentaries.com Another good website is um, documentaryheaven.com where you can find lots of conspiracy documentaries and well just documentaries in general. Today we'll also discuss Ukraine and the ongoing media wars and the effect it's having on Ukraine. I can certainly um, I can give you some perspectives on Ukraine having lived there for a number of years both in West Ukraine and sort of more um, central uh, central southern eastern Ukraine um, in Odessa. I've just returned from Odessa and uh, still got friends on all sides over there. Um, it's my opinion that it's really difficult to give an exact account of what's going on there um, because there's so many uh, parties involved including Russia, the US, the EU, probably others and secret services from those countries and more. There's a report on RT, Russia Today, and German media that Blackwater US troops are also on the ground in Ukraine. That certainly wouldn't surprise me at all. There's business interests playing a part, for example, um, Gazprom, of which Putin has at least a 5% stake, but probably more um, via friends. There is, um, basically, it's all about West Ukraine, which is fiercely nationalistic, in which a lot of people would say were responsible for the um, the overthrow of the government um, uh, of Yanukovych at the Maidan in Kiev. Uh, they, they mostly in West Ukraine speak Ukrainian, the Ukrainian language, and embrace all things Ukrainian traditions, um, etc. And there's some fine, decent people amongst them. It wasn't just um, Nazi fascist types that, that that some of the news would have you believe. There's some decent people amongst them. Um, but there are also the ultra-nationalists who are less friendly and are linked to the killings in Odessa. Actually, I was there at the time. M most of those, most of that was caused by football hooligans. You know, it's not really that wasn't so much about politi politics, in my opinion. You know, if you, th th those football hooligans used to march down the street uh, when I was working in the centre of Odessa, and they never looked like the friendliest of people to me. They were coming. They came from the Chorny Moritz Football Club. Anyway, East Ukraine is more pro-Russian with Russian-speaking citizens and there's a lot of trouble over there at the moment with the Ukrainian army staging attacks on uh, whatever you want to call the people who've taken over institutions there. I mean, 
one person's insurgent is another person's um, freedom fighter. You know, there's pro-Russians, you could call them. If, um, it depends on which side you're on and what you want to call yourself, really. Um, it's quite easy to upset people if you name them the wrong name anyway, so I'm not going to go there. I tend to just say pro-Russian and pro-Ukrainian just for just because it's easier. I'm not really on a side myself, but I guess my views do side more on getting rid of criminal governments. So initially, I would say I would say I supported the Maidan, but I don't know. Things have changed since. I don't think it's gone quite the way I would have hoped it had gone anyway. I like the I like um, criminal governments being replaced, but um, I don't know. I think the situation in Ukraine is far more complicated. Let's go to um, one of our growing team of academic researchers. We've got we've got a number of researchers now, and um, hopefully getting some more too. But let's go over to one of our academic researchers today. Hi, Anthony. How are you doing? Hello. I'm I'm pretty well. How are you? Yeah, not bad. Thanks. Not bad. No, it's good good to be back. Yeah, it's nice to be back from Ukraine. You know, as I was leaving, there was hordes of people marching down the street, shouting um, shouting things. So um, it seemed like it was a good time to go. Were they shouting things at you? Uh, no, I don't think so. They were actually looking uh, towards the centre of Odessa, so uh, I don't think it was oh. anything I said. <laughs> okay, you sure it wasn't please don't leave? Um, well, I'd like to think so, but um, no, they, they didn't seem that jovial, to be honest. So, um, listen, I, I wanted to talk to you uh, a little bit this week about uh, a situation which we're all familiar with. Uh, it's the situation in Ukraine. Uh, I know it's been discussed a lot on this this program, uh, but I, I just want to put in my two cents, if I if I may, and I, and I want to get your reaction to it because look, like you, I've I've lived in Ukraine. I lived there for a few years, uh, but now I'm seeing the whole thing from the sidelines. Uh, so I'm just interested to find out what you think. Um, my <laughs> the main thing I want to say about this war, and it, which I, I think is all but inevitable now, is that if a war happens in Ukraine, it's a very stupid war. Um, and it's stupid for a few specific reasons. Uh, if you look into the factors which are bringing Ukraine closer and closer to war, there are a few things which really stand out. Uh, the first thing is socialization in Ukrainian society. And by that I mean uh, on both sides of the political fence, there's definite uh, evidence that Ukrainians are socialized to be violent and they're socialized to solve their problems through violence. Now, not everybody in Ukrainian society is violent, I'm not saying that, but there are definite cues you know, that violence is a legitimate solution to problems in the way Ukrainian people are raised. They're also socialized not to listen to opposing points of view. And that's a really big problem. Um, but, when you say mm -hmm. they're socialized um, not to, because I have observed this. I've definitely, I, I totally agree with what you're saying. So, but have you found out information that, that suggests that they're at, this is actually a learned process? I'm looking at, uh, I'm looking at uh, parental upbringing techniques, and I'm looking at uh, the fact that there are Ukrainian schools in Ukraine and Russian schools. So in a city like Lviv, parents have to make a choice. Will I send my child to a Russian school or will I send my child to a Ukrainian school? And in those schools, they're streamed into different views of society. But most importantly, uh, Ukrainian children, I would like to suggest, are socialized to hate from an early age. Now, again, I don't say this is all Ukrainian children, definitely not, but definitely a significant percentage. And um, what are you basing those um, these beliefs of yours on? Well, I'll, I'll give you one example. Uh, my wife is Ukrainian and uh, she teaches children and she was in a lesson, uh, a one-to-one -one lesson, individual student, uh, some years ago. and. The boy she was teaching was an ethnically Russian, sorry, an ethnically Ukrainian nine-year-old boy. And in the middle of the lesson, the boy suddenly informed my wife that, quote, I hate all Russians. This is a boy of nine years of age. Uh, now, that can only come from the schoolyard or from parents. And this is 
something which is deeply disturbing. You know, from a from a very young age, uh, people on the uh, let's say Western Ukrainian Ukrainian speaking side of the equation are told about the um, famines of the 1930s and told that Stalin deliberately engineered the famines in order to kill the Ukrainians uh, because his his aim was genocide. That particular episode in history is very contentious. You know? But I'm not saying they're wrong about that. I'm saying it's debatable. However, kids learn this when they're kids, the way we learn fairy tales, you know, um, that Russians tried to kill them, all of them. Um, on the Russian side, you hear about uh, people like Stepan Bandera, Stepan Bandera, very Bandera, very controversial figure. Uh, he he was the leader of a, a let's say partisans army in Western Ukraine. And look, depending on your point of view, either fought with the Nazis because he was a fascist, or fought with the Nazis because he saw them as the lesser of two evils. As in, uh, Ukraine was stuck. You know, when Nazi Germany decided to invade the, the Soviet Union, uh, this was effectively an invasion of Russia with Ukraine stuck in between, and Poland as well. Uh, and so the other point of view is Bandera looked at the prospects of being occupied forever by Nazi Germany and the prospects of being occupied forever by Russia and decided that, uh, that the Nazis probably weren't going to stay around forever and the Soviet Union would, and therefore sided with the quote-unquote lesser of two evils. That's one point of view. The other point of view is that he was a Nazi. <laughs> uh, I'm not saying which one is which one is correct. I don't think it's for me to say. But I am saying uh, kids learn this you know, from a very early age, and they're told that on the on the uh, Russian in the Russian speaking parts of Ukraine, they're they're told, or at least it's implied, uh, that the Ukrainian speakers of today are the direct ideological descendants of that. Uh, that man and that movement. Now, if you're told that from childhood, then you, you're being told this at a time when your your brain is still developing. So really, what what's probably going to happen to you, unless you have an epiphany at some point in your life, you, you grow up believing that. And that is a huge problem. Um, this is a phenomenon, by the way, that's well studied in the uh, Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Uh, uh, school textbooks have been analysed, and there was a report released last year uh, saying that both sides uh, vilify the other and teach a very dark view of the other in the primary school classroom. And I've um, uh, I've actually seen that um, well on, on video anyway. There was a documentary that that went inside the schools, and um, it was disgusting. I I I um in, you know. At, in talking about the Ukrainian teachers that must do this and in the Israelis and the Palestinians, I just think shame on these people, you know, whatever you believe, don't pass it on to the next generation. It's Absolutely. Not, it's, you know, it's disgusting. Absolutely. I don't think it's as overt in Ukraine as it is in Israel and Palestine, but uh, I, I definitely think it's present in the upbringing of a lot of Ukrainian children and I think it's really sad because it, it vastly reduces the prospects for either a peaceful solution now or a peaceful future for the country. The second problem in Ukraine is these information wars. The way information has been handled in Ukraine uh, is just just ridiculous. Uh, I'll give you a couple of examples of this. Um, about a week ago, uh, there was a rumor going around on, on Vkontakte, the Russian Facebook, that the, the Victory Day Parade was going to be cancelled in Kiev and that the government had ordered, or the government was going to order the military to shoot anyone who was wearing a Soviet medal, okay, in Kiev, in the city. That was, that was the rumour that was going around. So I think, I think I'd heard some rumours like that. I've, I've definitely heard either that rumour or similar ones whilst I was there. Yeah, so so let's let's have a look at the um, the anatomy of this rumor. Some of the uh, some of the Victory Day celebrations were actually cancelled, as it turned out, for security reasons. And yeah, getting fifty thousand people together in one place is probably a bad idea at the moment. But uh, this is how the rumor started. There were a few veterans out on the street uh, in Kiev, just sitting in a park, 
And they were having a big complaint, as, as you know, elderly people are sometimes known to do. They were having a big complaint about the government. And one of them said, you know what? Um, I bet they're going to cancel the Victory Day celebrations. And if we go out with our medals, we'll be shot in the head. All right? Mm-hmm. Okay. One Twitter user, one. One Twitter user overheard the conversation and tweeted it. One user. Um, the tweet was picked up by the office of um, Aksinov, who's the Prime Minister of Crimea now. His office just picked it up, right? Uh, and Aksinov is a provocateur. He's a, he's a bastard. He's a real troublemaker. He's not even in Ukraine anymore, but he just can't resist the temptation to, you know, take a pot shot at the government in Kiev. So they... <laughs> So their office reported this tweet as news on the website, on their website. Yeah? And the next thing you know, it's spreading through the social networks and it's become fact among the Russian-speaking half of the population. And, and it does seem that, that that's occurred quite a lot and uh, they, they, yeah. it becomes fact very quickly. And it's, it's, it's the old scenario of people believing what they want to believe because it fits in with their, um, their perspective, basically. And at the moment, they're very willing to believe the darkest possible version of anything that happens. There was a car found uh, early this morning uh, outside the or near the city lim- limits of Luhansk, and the car was riddled with bullets. And inside the car were a man and a woman, seems husband and wife. Um, there has been no investigation, and there is no uh, real indication yet of how these two people came to die in their car. However, on the Russian social networks, it has already been concluded that the military uh, killed them in cold blood because they wanted to leave the city. Yeah. And that's it. So people just say it, somebody says it, and then it becomes fact. Yeah, and no, I, I've, I've no, I noticed that, and it, it, that, that applies to both sides, to, to yes, people, to, to pro, and I, you know, I, I, for, for ease, I, I call them pro-Ukrainians, pro-Russians. It's probably not technically correct because um, some people have already been upset by, by by that terminology. But you know, it just simplifies things a bit. I agree. It is difficult to know exactly how to how to refer to um, the various parties involved in this. But but yeah, I mean, they will just report something without evidence. It will spread like wildfire. And we're talking about millions of people who believe something when there's no basis for this belief. And it's just getting worse. It's really ratcheting up since the fire in Odessa. But look, I think I think the biggest problem at the moment is that there is a real will for war in Ukraine. Um, I mean, the US has played a role. Russia has played a role, of course. The EU as well. They're, they're all in there. I think Yanukovych uh, played a role. Arguably, some of the stupid decisions that the government and Kiev have made. Uh, but look, if... The, the people who are going to make this war start are Ukrainians themselves because a significant percentage of them seem, seem to want it. There are negotiable solutions without any doubt at all, but, but too many people just don't want a negotiated solution. They're, they're ready for a war. And they're so, and they're so ready to be uh, manipulated. They absolutely are, yeah. I think it, it, it's really easy to stir, to stir them up because uh, there's, there's something... There's something in the country at the moment. It is, it's like a social disease that they want to get out in the street and be covered in blood. And as long as that goes on, um, it's, it's not going to, uh, nothing's going to work. No negotiated solution can work. You know, we're looking at a Balkan style situation. Um, and, and I don't think it's going to stop unless more people want it to. Some obviously do, but there are too many who don't at this point. Yeah, so the, one, the all, ones that um, the ones that don't want a war in Ukraine, I think it's they really need to gather together, stand up, and make their voices heard. Like you know, start taking to the streets themselves, yeah, calling for peace. A bit like you know, during the seventies with the peace movement and stuff. We need we, 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 we need we need the hippie Ukrainians to to come out. So I don't know how that be re- would be received. You know, there was a there was an incident a few months ago in Russia where there was a peace protester on the on the streets of St. Petersburg. He was just standing on the side of the street with a sign that said uh, "Peace of the World," and he got spat on, beaten, and then moved on by the police. And that probably sums up the problems of the entire world, really. At the moment. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So it's, uh, for all of those reasons, I, I think it's a really stupid war. All war is stupid, but this one is monumentally stupid so and, and I, yet and yet it looks 
from what I observed in Odessa, it looks inevitable. I don't see how at least a civil war in Ukraine is going to be stopped because of this mentality. You can't change a mentality overnight, so it seems inevitable. Whether it'll merge into World War Three, that remains to be seen, but I can't yeah. see how this is going to be stopped. I, I think you're right, but I, I really hope you're wrong. You know, For all my friends in Ukraine, I, I hope that you're you're wrong. I don't want to see any of them splattered on a street. Absolutely, so, yeah, and I, and I hope I'm wrong too, but yeah. just yeah. just saying what I saw, you know. Let's hope for the best. Okay, um, and you were also um, investigating another topic this week. What what topic was that? I was uh, on a on a very marginally lighter note. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, I've been looking a bit into this uh, silver orbs phenomenon. Because as, as far as I understand, there have been some fresh sightings recently, is that right? I think there's there's regular sightings of these uh, silver orbs, um, but I, th I think there have been some uh, recently, but the, to be honest, it seems like um, it seems like they're observed quite regularly, sort of, you know, every every month or two. They certainly are, and, and they've been around for a long time. Uh, if, you, if you look into the uh, history of them, it goes back to, well, at least to the last two years of World War II. Uh, when they were quite regularly buzzing military pilots, you know, both the Allies and the Axis powers. And uh, World War II pilots reported various kinds of UFOs. When I, when I say UFO, by the way, I mean just literally a flying object that, that can't be identified. I'm not necessarily meaning an alien craft. Oh, absolutely. You know, you know and and, and uh, that's, that's nearly always the case. I mean... If someone says UFO, uh, it does mean unidentified. It doesn't. It doesn't have to mean aliens, you know. And uh, we'll we'll pr we'll probably try and discuss that a little bit in a minute. But yeah, I mean, if if it's unidentified, it's unidentified, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So so the silver orbs were, were one kind uh, of these um, these unidentified craft, and collectively the the pilots in World War Two nicknamed them Foo Fighters which is a phrase I'm sure you've heard. It is. Actually, uh, it was, uh, I much preferred Nirvana myself. <laughs> me too. Um, actually, it was a specific squadron that came up with a nickname. Uh, they were called the 415th Night Fighter Squadron, and the original term they used was fucking Foo Fighters. <laughs> okay, um, I can see why that one didn't stick so easily. Um, obviously, they were, they were a bit concerned, you know, because these, uh, you had uh, airplanes going out on missions, and then these weird crafts, you know, either flaming red balls or silver spheres or whatever, following them home after missions and performing all kinds of amazing maneuvers. I mean, they couldn't be outrun by any fighters. They couldn't be shot down. Not a single one was shot or hit. An interesting thing about this is that at the time when all that was happening, it was definitely not a secret. Um, that all of this, the secrecy about UFOs came later. Yeah. So, so in uh, December of 1944, for example, the Supreme Allied Command actually released a press statement about UFOs. Yeah. They, they were saying it's a German weapon, um, though they had to retract that later because German and Japanese pilots were also reporting them, they found out. Um, and there, was, uh, made, there were major articles in newspapers and Time magazine and so on. There's a great one in an Italian national newspaper from 1945. It's a full-page spread. And it says, government creates first flying disc. And it has a, a blueprint of a UFO printed in the national news. So, you know, at the time, it was very much out there in the open, you know. Um, and, and after the war, these sightings just kept happening. Um, in fact, uh, there was one occasion in 1952 when there were multiple sightings of these orbs and fireballs around the U.S. National Airport in Washington. And at the same time, because it was near the airport, they all showed up on radar. So the visual sightings and the radar detections uh, directly matched. And apparently, one of the people who was present when all that was happening was John McCain, who, who ran against uh, Obama in 2008. Oh, yeah? <laughs> so... So if Senator McCain had won the election in 2008, we'd now have a U U.S. president who had seen a UFO. <laughs> All right. Okay. So, yeah, yeah. so that would have been interesting. <laughs> but there was, there was uh, an incident later in 1976, and I think you've seen the film of this. Uh, I think you sent it to me. Uh, when one of these silver orbs turned up on a video of the Concorde. That's right. Yeah, that was, um, that was very interesting. And what did you think of that video? 
I, I thought the video was really interesting, and I found out it was uh, it, it was an official British Airways documentary. So it was shot from another BA aircraft. Uh, it's it's kind of hard to say if it's genuine or not, but it, it doesn't seem like a hoax. Uh, there have been a lot of possible explanations, you know, about camera lens problems and so on. Uh, but it's very arrested, arresting footage. I, I would say to um, to all the listeners, they should try and find it on YouTube. Cause it's, yeah, it's an interesting video. I think if you if you go onto YouTube and just type in uh, Concord UFO Silver Orb or something like that, you should you should come across it. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So, so then we we entered this this new phase uh, in 1953. Uh, by that stage, there had already been uh, three committees set up in the U.S. to try and work out what the hell these things were. You know, the first one was in 1946, and the most famous one was uh, Project Blue Book, which I think is quite famous in conspiracy. That's stories. right. Yeah, it is. Yeah. 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 So there was a huge uh, public interest at the moment, at that time in the subject of UFOs, and then in 1953, the, the CIA it was pretty young then. They put together a panel of experts. So physicists, meteorologists, people like this. And uh, they were called the Robertson Panel. And the idea of this was to try and uh, formulate some kind of official response to the UFO phenomenon based on all the findings of these committees like Blue Book. Yeah. So they took about six years' worth of data, right, extensive data, and they looked over it for about 12 hours and then immediately produced a report. <laughs> Mm-hmm. And they made some they made some astonishing recommendations. So first of all, they said the vast majority of UFO sightings had simple natural explanations, and the rest probably could be explained with further investigation. But it just wasn't that important. That's what they said after half a day. Mm-hmm. It's just not that important. You know? okay. Then, then they went on to say that these reports were a potential danger you know, because they overwhelmed intelligence channels. So, so the argument was. While investigators were dealing with all of these flying sources, a real threat to the U.S. might appear, and that it might be reported, but it would potentially be missed. Yeah. So they recommended that the U.S. Air Force de-emphasize the subject of UFOs and start a debunking campaign. And uh, they went. They they suggested getting the mass media involved. Specifically, they named Walt Disney. They they felt that Disney could help. Uh, they said that psychologists. And people in they the said entertainment that, they industry. They said that Disney could help. That Disney could help to debunk UFOs. Yes. Mm, yeah. um, I've always been. Um, I've always been suspicious about um, Disney because uh, you know they they produce Britney Spears and uh, Justin Timberlake as well. Yeah, and there's a whole there's a whole other episode in the pro- of the program in the Walt Disney CIA theory. <laughs> also said uh, psychologists, entertainers, and astronomers should all be brought into the fold you know, and encouraged to ridicule anyone who claimed to see a UFO. Basically, yeah, and, that, and that's definitely that's definitely happened since the fifties, really, because yeah, I do remember it during the fifties, and um, it was taken seriously and investigated, and and then ever since then, anyone who says they've seen a UFO, despite the fact Hundreds of thousands of people do see them. They're just, you know, turned into, into a laughing stock, you know. Yeah, and this is a committee representation, supposedly to uh, protect the intelligence community from just an overwhelming number of reports. So the, the strategy was, uh, was question the sanity of anyone who, who says they see one. Last thing, by that time, you already had UFO groups springing up. You know, like all these groups like MUFON, they were already starting to form. And this Robertson panel, the CIA panel, they suggested that these groups should be placed under surveillance because they could be a potential potential subversive influence in society. Right. Mm -hmm. So the the question, obviously, is is whether this panel's recommendations were followed up. And there's pretty strong evidence that they were, not just in the next few years, but for decades afterwards and possibly even up till now. Uh, yeah, but these days, so we're, we're, these days we're all being listened to, so it doesn't really matter anymore, does it? Well, this is true, yeah. Why are they listening to us now? Who can tell? It could be one of a dozen reasons. Mm. But we went, from, we went from, you know, look at these silver orbs, aren't they exciting, and don't we want to know, to, ah, look, it's a weather balloon. And if you say it isn't, we're going to put you in an institution. And just all based on this kind of Cold War paranoia about security threats, all that stuff. But, you know, 60 years later... We're, we're still seeing UFOs now. I mean, it's happening all the time, you know. 
Um, here in Ankara, there was a uh, there was a big sighting in 2012. It wasn't a silver orb. It was more like a, a huge mothership thing, and it just hung over the city for about half an hour before sunset. Yeah. Uh, as usual, there was a, a very a really pitiful scientific explanation. Yeah, there was something called a lenticular cloud, which is a, a stationary lens-shaped cloud. Right? That was the explanation. Have you done, thing, is there any video of this at all? There is, and you can see it on YouTube. Well, um, what would you have to type in on YouTube? Have you seen the video yourself? Mm-hmm. What, what, yeah, what, what, uh, what UFO, would you to... I would say just type in UFO Ankara 2012. Okay. I thought it was not conclusive, but, but, uh, but it seemed like a UFO... Uh, uh, an aircraft, let's say an aerial craft, was was definitely a better explanation than a cloud. Okay, so I'm um, sorry, An Ankara, which which year? UFO 2012. So it was December of 2012, I think. Okay. I would say uh, I would say it's I, I can't watch it now, by the way, because you know YouTube is banned in Turkey. I can get it on campus, but I can't get it outside, so I can't watch it again. But um, but uh, yeah, it, it is a bit sort of hazy and fuzzy around the edges. Run like a cloud from from what I remember, but I I just looked at it and I went, all right, it might not be the mothership, but it's definitely not a fucking cloud. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it seems to have um, it seems to have um like a a cloud like top part in the shape of a mothership, and then underneath it a very kind of more pronounced whiter ring, which doesn't. Uh -huh. I mean, the whole thing together together doesn't look like your average cloud. I think it's it certainly doesn't. It, it's fair to say that. Um, yeah. uh, I don't know. I, I I reckon it's probably man-made in some way, but whether it's yeah. a man-made cloud, because you know, I've I've talked about weather modification in um, yeah. this program before. Whether it's a, a, um, something that's created by by man using some kind of weather modification uh, machine or something. Yeah, I mean, there's been uh, quite a bit written on the internet because I researched it uh, after you mentioned it. There's quite a bit written on the internet about chemtrails in Turkey, so that could relate. I hadn't thought of that. Yeah. Hmm. Anyway, let, uh, please continue. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so the debunkers proposed something called a lenticular cloud, which is a, a stationary lens shaped cloud. Yeah. But, you know, this thing appeared on a cloudless day. It was bright orange, and it was definitely not your average cloud. If it's if it looks like anything apart from a spaceship, it, it, it looks like something that may be connected to chemtrails. But uh, I don't know, I'm speculating. But thousands of witnesses. And, you know, I'm a, I'm a lifelong skeptic when it comes to unexplained phenomena. You know, I'm, I'm an interested skeptic, definitely. But still, I, 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 I tend to be skeptical. But I, ha I have to say, this, this has really been a, a, a pattern. I mean, these, these really lame explanations for, for really intriguing and bizarre you know, aerial phenomena. Yeah. Actually, um, a while ago, uh, on the conspiracy website, uh, there was a thread about the, the weather balloon theory, um, and it was it was you know the usual stuff about you know UFOs being explained away as weather balloons, blah blah blah. And then um, a guy got onto the thread and said, um, "Hi, I I actually launch weather balloons for a living," <laughs> and, and he explained. Uh, what you should look for if you if you're looking for a weather balloon, they have a metallic coloured target in the centre of them to assist in radar detection. So if you're not looking at something with a colour target printed in the middle of it, then you're not looking at a weather balloon. <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, h half the time it's quite obvious that these these things aren't weather balloons. But I, I I guess there must be some occasion where where a weather balloon is mistaken for a UFO, but most of the time I don't think it's anything to do I'm, with that. I'm sure there are. I I, I briefly thought that I'd seen one in Sydney one time, it turned out to be a Zeppelin. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. you know, obviously, you can make errors. But you, some... you can indeed. I, I once looked out the window and I thought I could see one, then I realised it, it was a candle that was reflected in the window uh, from behind me, so yeah, it's very easy. Yeah. Anyway, so if they're not clouds and they're not weather balloons, then, then you know, what are they? Um, and here's where we get into the theories. Um, um, there's the Sonelmo fire theory. Yeah, Sonelmo fire is a, a weather phenomenon. It happens uh, when an object naturally discharges electricity into uh, into an atmosphere that's already strongly charged, and so you get the stuff created called plasma, and it's luminous, and it can look like a ball lightning or a fireball or or a, um, a glowing light, various things like this. And uh, 
it most often happens during thunderstorms or volcanic eruptions because they charge up the atmosphere. Yeah. So if you introduce something into that kind of environment, like, say, an aeroplane, uh, then you can get these plasma displays, and they're, they're pretty spectacular. But not a hugely convincing explanation, I don't think, because not, I mean, a, a very, very small percentage of the number of UFO sightings have happened during volcanic eruptions you know, or thunderstorms, so mm. it's clearly not that. Yeah. Um, there's another explanation which I think does hold water, and it's the, you know, the whole government testing experimental aircraft theory. And uh, <laughs> you remember a while ago we were talking about information management and you mentioned that uh, everything goes back to the Nazis. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I, I'm afraid I have to tell you again that, that uh, once again this, this story goes back to the Nazis. <laughs> oh, okay. um, I, I mentioned at the start, um, in some cases, uh, the Allied Supreme Command in World War II were concerned that these things might be Nazi weapons. And we know that towards the end of the war, the Nazis did develop some flying machines that were just not like anything that anyone else had, had developed up to that point. You, know, you had the V-1 and the V-2 rockets. You had the first jet fighters. You had a thing called a flying wing which would turn out to be significant later. They were thinking about um, aerial uh, propulsion, jet propulsion, and other means of aerial propulsion in a way that uh, nobody else was. Uh, well, weren't they also looking at anti-gravity machines as well? They were, and I want to talk about that because that is really interesting. I, and uh, I, I think that it plays a part in this whole puzzle, definitely. So we, we know that after the war, you know, some of the scientists who were working on these projects were transferred to the USA as part of this uh, thing called Operation Paperclip. You know? And the official story was that the Americans wanted to prevent the USSR from getting hold of these scientists uh, and their, you know, technological advances. Um, also, uh, a little less famously, the US also wanted to prevent Britain from getting hold of the technology. So they they smuggled a bunch of scientists into the US via Latin America. They sanitized their personal records so that all the connections to the Nazi Party were erased, and then they they set them to work in various facilities. Uh, and a large number of these guys were rocket scientists and aeronautical engineers. Um, the, the aeronautics guys mostly ended up at a place called Wright Field, which was a high security storage facility. And in that facility uh, was stored all of the technology that had been, uh, let's say, captured from the Luftwaffe in the last phase of the war when the Americans occupied Germany. And this was, uh, this definitely was secret technology. This was not just, oh, look, their planes are nice, let's take them. This was, uh, the, the classified stuff. So it was all stored at this right, this place, right field. And then these aeronautical engineers from Germany were brought over to this place. Now, uh, paperclip continued actually until 1990. And altogether, uh, there were about 1,600 scientists involved in it. Well, one of them ended up on um, Plum Island as well, I believe. Uh, really? He headed the experiment. Uh, they started experimenting on uh, animals and on uh, insects on Plum Island mm -hmm. in the U.S. And um, there, there's a there's a there, a there is a conspiracy theory that one of the insects escaped from the island when they put some disease inside it. And the the nearest uh, the nearest city to um, Plum Island on, on the coast of the, of the USA is a, a place called Lyme, uh -huh. and that's where the first case of Lyme's disease occurred. Oh, really? And, and a lot of people say it was because of the the little insects they were doing tests on uh, as part of Project Paperclip. Um, as one, uh -huh. of the, one of the um, Nazi experimenters um, actually headed a group on Plum Island. So yeah, mm -hmm. there, there's loads of uh, loads of conspiracies connected to that Project Paperclip. But please, yeah. anyway, please do go on. Yeah, no, you're right. You're absolutely right. I'd, I'd not heard about that one, but, but yeah, Paperclip was huge. Um, and if you ask for an official answer, because Paperclip is acknowledged now, I mean, it, 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 it's acknowledged that it existed, uh, and the official answer is they were helping the US they become rich, right, by patenting various technologies. So they, those guys would work on, a, on a, some kind of technological uh, advance, and then they would patent it. And in fact, by the time the project finished, they, the... Um, that Operation Paperclip had submitted about $10 billion worth of patents, which really is a fairly significant contribution to the wealth of the USA. 
Yeah. So that's the official answer. <laughs> but um, how does this link back to silver orbs and UFOs and all that kind of stuff? Well, some of uh, the German blueprints from the end of the war were for inventions like uh, disc-shaped aircraft and the flying wing that I mentioned. Uh, and in 1947, you had the, the first big reported flying saucer sighting in America. Yeah. Um, you might have, you may have may have heard of this guy Kenneth Arnold. Uh, no, saw, no, I can't say I have. Okay, well he saw nine craft and he described them all differently, but he described one as looking like a saucer, hence the term flying saucer. Oh, okay. Yeah? Mm -hmm. But the others were shaped differently. You know, there were flying discs, flying wings, and and flying orbs. Yeah. So then lots of, started, lots of other reports started surfacing, and, and these were very similar. Uh, also, very similar to these German uh, aeronautical engineering projects that the Americans had seized. And it seems, I mean, it, it seemed almost as though they were so similar that it seemed almost as though somebody else had continued working on these projects you know, to bring them to fruition. Now, this also, I think possibly the most interesting case is uh, a guy called Victor Schauberger. He was an amazingly, uh, let's say, unorthodox and ingenious kind of inventor. Yeah, he, He's one of those guys, uh, kind of like Nikola Tesla. So Tesla is famous now, yeah, but for a long time he was in that uh, guys who should be more famous category. And I think Schauberger is the same. So to give you an example, he was the first person to propose cold fusion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So kind of a thinking out of the box guy, right? But he did actually also invent a flying disc, and and this is not conspiracy theory. <laughs> this is just uncontroversial fact. He tested it; it worked. Uh, he was into he was actually a naturalist, and he was into this idea of creating something that he called levity. Uh, levity is the opposite of gravity. So he he found examples of it in nature, uh, forces which could not fight against gravity, like uh, traditional aeronautics, but kind of cancel it out. Uh, and uh, so he studied water, for example, in great detail, and he found that in certain, uh, in certain instances, because of the unique topography of water, it could sometimes acquire this property of levity, the opposite of gravity, a kind of a pushing up force. You know? mm -hmm. so, he, so he reasoned that if you could generate this force inside an aircraft, then you wouldn't need conventional means of power. They just wouldn't be relevant anymore. You, you'd actually be using nature's own force to escape from all of the normal constraints like G-forces and all that kind of thing. So when we look at, when we see these films of UFOs and hear accounts of UFOs and strange maneuvers they make, you know, they don't seem to. People often say this. Witnesses say it didn't seem to obey the laws of gravity. Well, according to Schauberger, Nature doesn't always obey the laws of gravity because it has an opposing force of its own. Okay, so he produced blueprints for a flying machine, uh, which he said was shaped like a saucer, <laughs> and ran on this principle of levity. Uh, inside the machine, there was a thing that he called a liquid vortex propulsion system, and in this system, water would be rotated into this kind of twisting oscillation. It was called a colloidal. Um, so this particular rotation pattern of water that you occasionally see in nature, like a vortex. You know? And the result of that is this immense buildup of energy. Suddenly, uh, the water frees itself from gravity, and you get an enormous levitation force. You know? um, and this was what powered his machine, which worked. Uh, <laughs> There was was, it, was even, this um, was this orb shaped? It was. Uh, this one was saucer shaped. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now he actually built. Uh, sorry. He th there's a report that he wrote a letter to one of his friends. Yeah. Uh, talking about an orb design, saying that a prototype of it had been constructed in Nazi Germany uh, during the Second World War using prison labor at the Mauthausen concentration camp. According to the story, um, in his letter, he wrote that the craft actually flew on the 19th of February, 1945, near Prague. And in three minutes, it went from the ground to 45,000 feet. 
Wow, and that's, that's amazing. Was that the is, Nazi bell that I've read about, or was that something else? I, I'm not sure about the Nazi bell. I, I think uh, Schauberger does turn up in the Nazi bell theories, but I'm not sure in exactly what connection. Um, he, unfortunately, according to Schauberger, he, the Nazis destroyed the prototype so the Allies wouldn't get hold of it. But still, I think it's extremely intriguing. He, he wasn't a paperclip scientist, um, and uh, in biographies, it's said that uh, he refused to, to work for the Nazis. There was uh, Apparently, he met Hitler in 1934, and Hitler um, tried to woo him, but he refused. But that's what his biographers say. And you know, I think if I think if Hitler tried to woo me, I'd, I'd refuse too. Yeah, <laughs> but but the thing is, these are. I mean, this is written by biographers that are just in awe of Schauberg. You know, amongst the people who know him, he's kind of a hero because he had so many ideas that were that were just so off the scale. You know, mm -hmm. but he did spend some time in the USA. He worked for a major aeronautical corporation, and uh, his projects are just so similar to the things that starting, started appearing in the skies in the late 40s, including the, the orbs, that it, it's hard not to suspect uh, a possible link. You know? okay. so, so in terms of this question about uh, how much knowledge governments have about, about seers and orbs and disks, this, this theory suggests uh, that they know everything, mm -hmm. <laughs> basically. No little green men required, just some very clever Germans. <laughs> Uh, given a big operating budget and amnesty, and that the government uh, knows all there is to know about these uh, uh, unidentified flying objects. And personally, I, I find this the most uh, convincing explanation. Now, if we talk about the uh, the alien theories, uh, there's there's a big challenge, I think, to be overcome by people who support the alien theories. Uh, and basically, it sounds silly, but uh, to paraphrase Douglas Adams, space is big. <laughs> I mean, the distances that you would need to cross yeah, in order to visit another inhabited world, I mean, you count those distances in terms of how many hundreds of years light takes to get to those other worlds. So, you know, if, if you want to put forward uh, an alien theory convincingly, um, I mean, I think it is possible. It's, well, what, I, about, I, um, what about wormholes? Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't rule it out, but I think there's, there's three things you need to consider, and you have to do at least one of these things. The first one is you need to show some evidence of a workaround solution for this light speed barrier. Well, so surely, surely that would be the wormholes, wouldn't it? Yeah, the wormholes are, are um, one theory which, which looks at that. How, how can this light speed barrier be broken? Yeah? And we have to acknowledge that we're living in a universe that's existed for 10 billion years longer than our planet has, meaning that they're would be a lot of time for civilizations to develop to a point where maybe they would work work out a solution like this. So that's possible. You know? uh, in my personal opinion, it hasn't been uh, proposed very convincingly yet, but I, I think that could change. You know? we'll, we'll see what happens with that. The, the second thing is you'd have to show evidence that the, the beings on these crafts had enormous lifespans. You know, because uh, if they did, then it would be worth them investing the time to get here. You know? And again, I think that's theoretically possible. You know, there have been some amazing discoveries about uh, creatures on Earth in the last 20 to 30 years. The, um, the creatures that live around the ocean vents, for example, which live for 300, and 300, 400 years and don't need oxygen to live. So given the variety of life on Earth, it's possible that you know, we could find a race of aliens who live for a couple of million years and therefore spending a couple of thousand years getting to us is worth their time. Again, it's, it's, it's still, it's, it hasn't been proven yet and we'll see what happens with that. Um, or the third thing, well, sorry, I should say, and the third thing, you'd have to give these guys a really good reason for making the journey. So, <laughs> You know, in, in your classic sci-fi stories, it's Martians coming to take over the Earth because they lack a mineral or something like that. Uh, we, we need a good reason why they would come because it's not, it's not an easy journey to make, even if you're using wormholes. But, um, but if, um, if someone, say, for example, saw some aliens or saw... Um, I mean, there have been cases where people have not only seen an unidentified object. They've actually seen the aliens. I mean, yes. now, assuming they're telling the truth, um, 
surely if they've seen one and they've seen an air, an alien staring them back in the face they don't need a reason they don't need a reason uh, the, 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 it, for them for them it, it, who cares about the reason they're, they're staring at one in the face so well, yes that is that is very true um, but uh, I think as an explanation for unexplained aerial phenomenon phenomena uh, it would be it, it would be very helpful to know uh, why, the, if these things are coming from another planet, what what are they doing when they get here? You know, these these uh, maybe they ha- maybe they're just having a rest. They, they might, yeah. <laughs> it's a it's a truck stop. Mm. Um, but I would, in, I, if I was an alien, I wouldn't stay here too long. Well, yeah, in World War Two, for example, these these uh, silver orbs and red flaming balls. They seem to be checking out the aircraft technology that we had, and the same with the Concord video and many other videos. This is this is a fairly t- this is fairly typical of their behaviour. They examine uh, er- aircraft which have been invented on Earth. So, is that is that a reason? Is there something in that? We we don't know, but we might know. We I mean, we'll, we'll see what happens. With yeah, that. we we have to keep an open mind. It could be. It could be that that one nation on this earth has developed, or even more than one nation, has developed extremely um, sophisticated technology that they're not telling anyone about. I mean, I, yeah. I've seen I've seen another video on the, on the inter- internet on the internet um, showing a missile launch. It seems mm-hmm. very authentic as well, a missile launch, and then a little silver orb comes alongside the missile and shoots a laser out. <laughs> um, and this is uh, this this was released by a guy who said he observed it. Um, you know, he he was actually part of the missile missile launch, and um, mm. it's very yeah, it's, it's stuff like that. Um, I must admit, when it comes to uh, the alien stories, the thing that actually made made me sort of take more notice was the um, things like the Travis Walton case. Uh-huh. Um, have you heard about that at all? I've heard about it. I don't know a lot about it. I mean, what it was, it was. Um, I'll briefly go through it. I might talk about it more after after our chat, but uh-huh. it was um, I don't know maybe six or seven guys who were who were um, working in fo- uh, forestry in the USA. I'm not sure which part of the USA, but they were cutting down trees and um, they'd finished for the day, started to drive back home, saw a light in the sky, and um, they drove towards it got closer and they saw a UFO, a disc. This was more of a disc one rather than these silver orbs. Mm -hmm. And they had lights coming from the bottom of it and it was quite clearly of uh, some kind of flying machine. It was it was quite low. Travis Walton was one of the people in the vehicle that day. He got out and started walking towards it, even though his friends told him to stay back because they they feared it was dangerous. They could see it was your traditional flying saucer with um, flashing lights and that kind of thing. Anyway, mm-hmm. a bit a beam came out from the bottom of this um, ship, and um, it knocked him down. And the other guys in the vehicle were terrified, and they they their immediate reaction was to to drive off. So they drove off, and then they they got some distance. They said, "We have to go back. We can't leave him there." And um, so they drove back, and when they got back, he was gone. Um, mm-hmm. So anyway, this this is a story you can check out on the um, internet, basically, um, because it's it's very convincing if you watch the documentary story behind with the, with the actual people involved. Because I remember watching, and I, I can't actually find it. I can find uh, they they've done similar ones, but the one I saw, it was the witnesses, the other the, the six guys talking about what happened, and they were they were still terrified to this day a lot of them have lost their jobs over this incident um, there's there's been relationship breakups so I think some of them won't even talk about it anymore mm-hmm. but you you could kind of tell they were telling the truth but anyway that's not the end of the story um, they drove back into town they, they, they tried to tell people what happened of course a lot of people didn't believe them said they were lying the police got involved um, this is all checkable by the way you can this was a, a checkable event um, the police got involved and then of course eventually they there was the you know they wanted to accuse them of possible murder because this guy is gone uh, he didn't turn up for a number of days and uh, they they had to go and take uh, they agreed to take lie detector tests uh, I think one of them refused to take the lie detector test but the others took the test and passed 
uh, with their UFO story because uh, they were they were just basically being laughed at by the police. So they brought in an expert, did a did lie detector test. The, the the ones that agreed to take it, they all passed. That they would that they at least believed they had seen some UFO and that what they were saying had happened. Anyway, a number of days later, I can't remember how many days, might have been five days, let's say. Um, Travis Walton turned up. Mm -hmm. um, he turned up, um, called somebody from a phone box. It was raining. Um, they went out and got him, brought him back, and um, everybody wanted to know what had happened, you know. And uh, he t he gave his account, which is basically being taken up inside a ship. And uh, they inside the ship, they were they were doing some experiments. He was terrified again. He tried to escape. There was uh, one person um, that he s described on the ship was of human appearance. Uh, but the others were clearly not of human appearance, and he described them. Um, anyway, he um, obviously the case then went on. He, that he was then accused of wasting police time. That this was all a lie. So everybody took everybody took lie detected tests, including himself, and they all they all passed. Um, and anyway, this went on for years and years. They all stuck to their stories. As I said, it didn't turn out well for them all i mean by sticking to this story a lot of them lost jobs and or were ridiculed and uh you know I, anyone who is interested in it just check out the story and I, I would recommend um try to watch try to find a good documentary online where where the people involved are talking because i have to say they're they're quite convincing some of these people some of them don't want to talk about it it's clear that they're, they're being dragged into something they don't want to talk about but um, have a look at that case. I would recommend anyone who thinks that, you know, UFOs, there, there can't be aliens. And I'm not saying, you know, I mean, there's a possibility somebody's lying, but it's a very convincing story when you've got six people all saying the same thing, passing line detector tests. If you listen to them, some of them are clearly quite scared about what, what happened that day. Travis Walton still sticks to his story. Um, it's, uh, it's it, that was a very convincing case for me anyway, so I recommend anyone who who who's still curious about finding out more uh, check into that. Can I say I, I think that a lot of uh, abduction accounts are are very convincing as well. There was a phenomenon, uh, and maybe still is, I don't know, but there was a phenomenon uh, in the U.S. where uh, cases of sexual assault uh, were reported as cases of abduction. Yeah. Uh, alien abduction, I mean, uh, and that that was quite a widespread phenomenon, and much the same way as cases of sexual assault were reported as cases of satanic ritual abuse. Uh, the the two things seemed to blossom around the same time, uh, and it, it it was, I mean, the, the theory is that uh, this is a result of the person who is who is the victim of the sexual assault is sexually abused by somebody who they love and trust. And cannot um, cannot comprehend that that person would sexually abuse them, and so has a fantasy uh, involving either Satanists or Little Green Men or whoever it might be. However, uh, that aside, I, I think there are a very great number of, of convincing accounts of, of uh, abduction. Yeah, so it is. Uh, yeah, it's it's an issue that. <clears throat> how can I say this? Um, I, I would say that the jury is still out, but I, I think that uh, that the, the you know the, the government aeronautical research thing, the alien uh, theory, there are um, there are certainly there's certainly evidence for both. Let's say that. Um, I, I wanted to also mention just lastly one one thing that I like. I, I don't think this is the most likely theory, but this is a theory that comes up every so often. It's an alien-based theory. And it's the, uh, we could call it the forfeited stewardship theory. So, in other words, we've forfeited our, forfeited our stewardship of the planet. And aliens, having seen what a mess we've made of it, have decided to do things like preserving samples of life on Earth so that the planet can be replenished when we're gone. I... I'm not saying that I that I'm going with this theory, but I, I do find it somehow very appealing. <laughs> do you, Do you mean that uh, uh, aliens are living amongst us? Is that what you're saying? I, I mean to say that uh, that that perhaps these abductions are not happening only to humans, but to other species as well, and that there is a vast G 
gene bank, this is the theory, there's a vast gene bank somewhere else in the galaxy of Earth, earthly genes because these aliens have seen the planet is on the road to disaster and in much the same way that zoos preserve some species that are that have become extinct or are about to become extinct in the wild and also they take samples from from captive animals in the hope of perhaps reintroducing those animals later when conditions improve uh, there's a lot of zoo programs that for which that that is the goal that tigers are a case in point uh, in much the same way, this theory goes, that, that and there is another race watching over the Earth thinking, oh my God, what are you guys doing down there? We have to create a gene bank so that when you finally get through this phase of incredible destruction and the Earth has a chance to recover, we might be able to repopulate it with some of the species you've destroyed. Um, it's, I, I know it's an incredibly outlandish theory. I don't I'm not saying it's true. I'm just saying it's quite appealing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll always look at all theories. I mean, I, I saw a documentary the other night, actually. Um, another thing that's worth checking out is a guy called Phil Schneider, who, who was basically saying that aliens are already here and they're living underground. Mm -hmm. And um, the curious thing about his case was... Uh, it was him and a number of friends who were working in construction and they'd come they were working on these underground bases for the military um and um they came across these aliens by mistake and there was uh, there was deaths involved and anyway uh he had a group of friends and one by one they were killed mysteriously mm -hmm. and um i was watching the documentary and phil schneider's actually talking in this documentary and he's saying all his friends have been killed over this and that um, he believes someone's following him. And then sure enough, documentary uh, ends and uh, Phil Schneider wound up dead himself, found, uh, found um, I think, hung, or he, some kind of ligature around his neck. Mm -hmm. And it was put down as suicide, um, but um, his friends and his wife believe it wasn't suicide. By the way, I'm talking about, talking about cover-ups and suicide. I read today, I was, I was looking at conspiracy theories and... Uh, and people had been um, killed under mysterious circumstances, and uh, one of them had two bullet holes to the head, and it was put down by the doctor as suicide. <laughs> and I just, thought, I just thought, how do you do that? That's a very determined suicide, isn't that it? That is, yeah. He didn't get it right first time, so he just made sure the second time. <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe it was trepanning. You know about self-trepanning? Oh, no, what, what's that? Opening a hole in the front of the skull in order to open the third eye. Maybe I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend this at home at all to any <laughs> listeners. It's a, it's a, it was a, a kind of a fad in the, let me think, the 70s perhaps. There, there is a footage around. I don't know uh, where you could find it. You, might, you may find it on the internet, but it's quite graphic footage of people just drilling into their skulls. It was, it was definitely... A, a, uh, like I said, a, a bit of a fad for a while, but I, I guess it's, it's not the kind of thing that's going to survive for a long time. You know, I can see, I can see why it might not have caught on anyway. <laughs> yeah. Um, another thing, another case I wanted to talk about was the Rendlesham Forest incident. Mm -hmm. uh, this was a UFO that landed in Rendlesham Forest in the UK on a military base. I think it was a US base actually. We do have some US bases over here in the UK. And do you? Was... No, you can't. That can't possibly be true. <laughs> yeah, some of them aren't secret either. Um, no, we have a U we have some US bases over here, and uh, mm. I don't know if if uh, Rendlesham Forest is one of them. But anyway, I, um, the UFO was was seen by military commanders. It was seen by um, people based there, and um, it's all been in, it's all been recorded. And basically, I, I saw a documentary where the the commander of the airbase said. This, this needs to be talked about and investigated because we can't have mysterious objects dropping in on, into, you know, air bases uh, and, you know, violating all the defences of that air base. Yeah, and we, we need to find out what this was. And actually, the Rendlesham Forest UFO was, um, was supposed to have hieroglyphics on the outside. They, that was mm -hmm. um, the witness statement said there was, he saw hieroglyphics on the outside of the, of the uh, aircraft. And, that's been uh, reported. That's been sorry to interrupt. You. That that has been reported quite a few times, by the way. It has actually, yeah. Unusual uh, symbols on the sides of these. Unusual aircraft. hieroglyphs or something, and mm. that that actually I think was um they had unusual hieroglyphs on the Nazi bell. So everything mm. does seem to go back to the Nazis. 
<laughs> one of these days we will talk about the Nazis and Fanta. <laughs> we will, we will, one day. So, shall we? Um, shall we call, uh, call it a day on this uh, subject? Yeah, yeah. Let's let's. I I, I just want to wrap up by saying uh, I I think there is um, I, I I think that the the alien theory has a lot to recommend it, but at, at this stage I, I think I'm going with the, with the top secret government aircraft theory. I think personally I'm going to go for both. Fair um, just, just, just so that um, basically I won't be wrong because I'll, I'll have covered both bases. <laughs> Good strategy. Okay, well, um, take it easy, and uh, we'll check in again with you soon. Okay. Okay. Thanks very much for having me on again, Scott. Yeah. No. Thank you. Okay. See you. Okay. Bye. So we touched on UFOs there, but I wanted to talk to another guest, researcher and UFO witness, um, who can hopefully talk a little bit more about the subject. We'll go now to Ben somewhere in London. Ben has been interested in the UFO phenomenon for many years and has witnessed a silver orb UFO. So he'd be ideal to talk to about the particular subject we're talking about today. Ben, hi and welcome to Truth Sentinel. Hi Scott, it's a pleasure to be here and to be invited on your show. You're most welcome. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure, I'm currently an early years worker working in the UK. Um, I've studied planetary science and astrophysics at Bristol University. Um, and I had a UFO, a sphere UFO uh, experience when I was younger. Yeah, can you tell us about that experience? How old were you at the time? I was seven at the time, but I did share the experience with my brother, who was older. And uh, what actually happened? We were actually playing in our house, um, and all of a sudden we noticed there was an eerie silence. We looked out the window and noticed this orb hovering above the road, uh, across the road. Uh, we looked at the the orb for some time. It must have been at least five minutes. Um, during that time, it it just didn't move at all, and we were completely awestruck by it. Whereabouts um whereabouts were you at the time? Which it was this in the UK? This was in London. In fact, during the summer, um, it was a bright, clear day. Um, there didn't seem to be any kind of other aeroplanes around at the time, um, and the the orb was just hovering there. It was completely seamless there was no admissions from it no lights um, were, you, were you already looking out the window at the time or did it catch your eye or something no we we're actually playing but we noticed this eerie silence and it was almost a feeling of somebody watching us almost so I don't know what drew our attention to it but we noticed this UFO and you know it just you know blew our minds really how long did you uh, watch it for? I mean, I guess it, it might have been at two to three minutes. It kind of felt like ten minutes at the time, but to, at the age of seven, you know, you don't really have a concept of these things too much. But it was a significant length of time, um, enough for us to, to view it, to see exactly what it looked like um, and, you know, what, if any, movement it made. And, and in this scenario, in this case, it, it didn't move one bit. And um, were you talking to each other at the time or did you just watch in silence? We just said, wow, you know, what, what's, what have we seen there? And we stared at it for a number of minutes. Um, following that, we ran downstairs to tell our mum. It must have taken us about five seconds to get down the stairs, open the front door, and it was gone. Um, and as I said, it was a, a bright, clear day. There wasn't any clouds in the sky. Uh, and the UFO was actually only across the road, hovering above a fir tree which must have been about 20 metres, so we got a really clear view of it. And uh, you told your mum about this experience, what did she think? Yeah, we, well, we called her out at the time and we said, you know, mum, come out and look at this thing, and by the time we got out, like I said, it was gone, so unfortunately she didn't get to ex share the experience that we had, but it's one that stayed with me for the rest of my life, and hence the planetary science and the research that I've done into UFOs since then. As well as seeing the UFO, did you have any sensation, did you feel anything? Uh, I mean, can you tell us a bit about what went through your mind at the time? As I said, it was very much like not only were we watching it, but it was watching us. And I don't know how or why I can say that, um, but it's just like the old feeling that you might get, like somebody's watching you, you turn around and you kind of see that somebody is. Um, that's as much as I can explain, really. Um, but as I, as I said about the UFO itself, um, it was completely seamless. The only way that I could describe it is it was comparable to a ball bearing, one that you might find um, in a wheel on a bicycle. 
um, but rather than shiny, it was completely dull. And what sort of size would you say it was? I'd approximate it because it was hovering above the fir tree, um, and it was wider than that. It must have been two to three meters in diameter. Um, Did it give off any sound at all? None whatsoever. There was no sound. There was no light. No emissions. No movements. No movements whatsoever. It was completely motionless for the length of time that we viewed it for, which was a number of minutes. Um, and what did your brother? Uh, what has your brother said about this um, in the years since? We've talked about it, and you know, it's it's kind of something that we don't talk about too often. Um, I, I think he was kind of a bit more freaked out by it than myself, and um, although I got, I almost. No, I couldn't say that I knew what it was, but I was familiar with um, military aircraft and conventional aircraft, and it was nothing like that. And, you know, in 1982, you know, as far as I'm aware, we didn't have the capabilities to levitate, keep a, an object motionless for a number of minutes. Um, so I could only ever believe, well, I have believed that it may well have been from not from this world really and um uh, obviously had a big effect on your life and you became very interested in ufos um did you start researching uh, silver orbs in particular not specifically i i really got like i said the impression that it wasn't from this world so i was very interested from that from that moment on in different experiences although it wasn't really till i was older that did i start looking into it um, I have come across different sphere uh, of UFOs on the internet. There's one particular case in Russia um, of a similar type of UFO, although in that, that occasion, which has been filmed, I think you can get it on YouTube, it's moving around a lot, up and down and hovering almost in an erratic way, uh, whereas what I experienced, like I said, was seemed much more controlled. So Ben, what other UFO events have particularly impressed you? Well, as well as the Travis Walton and Rendlesham Forest cases you've mentioned, um, listeners obviously know about the Roswell case in 47, as well as perhaps the Washington Flap case in 52, which was a massive case at the time. Um, there's also Barney and Betty Hill, um, who had an abduction in 1961, um, as well as some of your listeners may know about the nuclear missile base that was disabled um, 1967 in the USA um, and perhaps more recently um, the Mexican military encounter in which they videoed um, I believe 11 UFOs in 2004 um, similarly uh, Gary McKinnon who in 2002 hacked into military computer files um, looking for free energy and UFO cover-ups but he came across um, some information relating to non-terrestrial officers um, that was in the mili throughout the military uh, and government as well as other officials and as, as well as that he also found uh, inf evidence about uh, USA having space fleets in which uh, they've got their own crafts that can fly interstellar space travel as, uh, as we know it right now and um, he must have upset them to a certain extent because they wanted to extradite him to the US and it was only a last minute effort by politicians in the UK that stopped that happening. I mean, he's he's supposed to have Asperger's. Yeah, he's got Asperger's syndrome. Um, and I guess that may have been part of uh, the reason why he was able to be let off. Um, I mean, he's just thankful that he was um, and that the information got out to us because... You know, it's really compelling. But how much information really did get out? I mean, I'd love to get him on this show at some point and see if he can talk to us, but I've got a feeling maybe they, he's been told that he can't talk too much about it because I haven't heard an awful lot about what he saw. No, neither myself. I mean, it, it's gone quite quiet since it all came out. Um, hopefully you'll get an opportunity to do that, Scott, because um, you know I think it would really be beneficial for the public to hear a little bit more about it. Well, I have tweeted him, that's all I can say at the moment. Well, good luck with that, Scott. Um, one more question for you before you go. I know you're a busy man. What do you say to people who say UFOs are most likely advanced military craft originated from Earth and not necessarily of alien origin? 
Well, I can kind of understand that. Um, you know, you probably find that quite a lot of cases that it is military craft, um, but it's my belief that these are reverse engineered from originally alien crafts, um, you know, going back to the Roswell incident in 47, I think governments across the world, particularly the USA, Germany, as well as England and Russia, um, have had, a, had access to these alien crafts, like I said, re reversed engineered them and created their own. Um, and so you'll probably find that, you know, it's a mix really, but like I said, it's my belief that aliens are here and some of those alien crafts that you see are from alien origins. Um, and some are from military as well. Um, I just think it's it's a little far fetched to to think that we're the only life form in this universe um, with such an, a small speck in in such a massive place. And there's just got to be other life forms out there. And with some of the information coming through, you know, some something like what Bob Lazar's uh, come out and said that these crafts are able to traverse uh, interstellar space at a blink of an eye. Um, and light speed is not necessary in order to be able to do this. So, you know, any anyone that's kind of thinking that you know, it would take millions and hundreds of thousands of years at light speed to get here, um, you know, I don't believe that's true. It's it's just a question of. Okay, now the UFO subject is is such a, a huge subject, and we're only just lightly touching on it today. Um, I hope we can go in more detail in the future. Maybe you'll come back and um, discuss some other topics uh, to do with this same subject yeah I'd love to um, if any of your listeners have got any questions um, that they want answering or they want me to even look into some cases in more detail I'd love to come back Scott it's been a pleasure to be here so nice of Ben to join us today um, thanks for that topics coming up in future episodes could include conspiracies cover-ups more on UFOs other mysteries such as the Dyatlov Pass incident um, if you're not familiar with that, um, some climbers mysteriously died in the Ural Mountains. Best if you read the story, because we'll go into it in depth at some point. Uh, who knows what else we'll talk about. Anything where the truth about what happened is not yet agreed upon or is being covered up. This week, um, I've listened a little bit to Alex Jones, Hagman and Hagman. John B. Wells, you're in my bad book a bit this week after affecting our channel and... Um, cutting down the number of uh, listeners we've got. It's a long story, but he put a, um, his channel put a block on our channel due to a misunderstanding about an advert I had to support Caravans of, Caravans of Midnight. Please uh, subscribe both to Caravans of Midnight and to Scott Sentinel, because then you'll, you'll be prompted when a new episode comes up. We'll eventually be moving everything across to the Scott Sentinel channel. I think that's going to be the main channel because a lot of the features in on Caravans of Midnight are no longer usable. This is the section where we usually talk about economic, markets, sports, space or weather, those kind of things. One thing I wanted to talk about, Europe has, um, has committed 7.5 billion euros um, this decade to launch a fleet of environmental monitoring satellites which they call sentinels so i thought it would uh, it was very appropriate to mention them they have they're going to have specific roles viewing the earth using a range of observing techniques are they going to be spying on us or are they going to be spying on the weather i'm always slightly suspicious uh, the sentinels um fit in with what the ec calls its copernicus program sounds like something from a james bond movie this week's sport, weather and finance section. Um, we're going to listen a bit more to Mark Cockin, who also did comment on the weather and its connection to finance. Um, that should be interesting. Um, he spoke about the global banking elite last, um, last week and also expressed his religious views, which not everyone would agree upon, but we'll, we'll have a religious debate on another show. That's always sure to ignite um, a lot of debate. Anyway, here's a little bit more from Mark Cockin. Do the global warming issues have any connection to finance? Um, for example, I heard, I heard Al Gore has made millions from companies connected to climate change related businesses. Uh, absolutely. I mean, the, the, the example you quote from Al Gore has to be the most apparent one. Um, but yes, of course, it's related to finances. When you regard finance as a weapon of control, um, it's certainly related in that way, and let's face it, 
nations are being taxed the hills with their carbon taxes and, uh, and you know there's all the other things that they're planning to impose uh, on the basis of a, um, a hypothesis that doesn't stand up to scrutiny and that is that carbon dioxide is, a, is responsible for one of these changes when it's not it's quite provably something that's happening in the solar system and has happened before we're going through a cycle that's long recorded and people are waking up to this now. So, how can it be anything else other than a financial tool for control? If you follow me, that's, that's what lies behind the global warming myth. Now, the weather is changing and so on, but as I say, that's not down to carbon dioxide induced global warming, especially when water vapor is something like 100 times more powerful as a greenhouse gas than in carbon dioxide. It's like, come on, what points do you get your head out of your ass? And that's a, a perfect sentence to finish today's uh, interview. <laughs> get get your head out of your ass. Um, thanks, thanks for coming on Truth Sentinel today. Uh, we're to finish today on a lighter note, the deepest ever in a living fish have been discovered, scientists believe. A uh, UK Japanese team found the shoal of fish at um, a depth of about 4.8 miles, 7.7 .7 kilometers, in the Japanese trench in the Pacific. And they captured some of it on film. They were using remote operated landers, um, which I have been designed to withstand the pressures of that kind of depth and to comb the world's deepest depths of the oceans for marine life or for any kinds of life. You know, a lot of people, we, we talked about UFOs today and looking uh, for life on other planets and in the skies. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of life that we haven't discovered on our own planet. Uh, they found these fish and um, apparently it's, it's the first time they've been able to observe these fish. And um, someone actually said they were surprisingly cute. Um, I'm going to try and pronounce the name, the Latin name of these fish. They're called... Um, Sododoliparis amblystomoposis and um, you'll have to look that up if you think I pronounced it wrong so we're still discovering life on our own planet uh, there like to be a lot more hidden creatures beneath the sea maybe in the jungles, who knows some people believe we have other species living are actually amongst us as well that's another story um, I was trying to stay non-conspiratorial but failed dismally Anyway, always looking for sponsors, advertisers, financiers. Please contact us. Um, we'd love to be able to um, invest in more research and travel. So please get in touch via Facebook, Twitter, or YouTube email. Um, Scott Sentinel, you can do a search for. Our email is actually scottsentinel9 at gmail.com. That's scottsentinel9 at gmail.com. Contact us for any reason. Uh, if you want to come on the show, or if you want to help in some way, or if you want to invest. Let us know uh, how the sound is coming through, any ways we can improve. Thanks very much. Thanks for listening to Truth Sentinel today. Goodbye.